Okay. I have the honor of introducing Dr. Moses Malero. He's the Associate uh, Professor of Seed Breeding and Genetics at Bunda College in Malawi. And his research in evaluating different quinoa varieties at Bunda is the first of its kind in the region. Uh, so welcome. Thank you, uh, Morgan. <clears throat> Uh, thank you. I would like to first uh, thank Kevin and uh, your fantastic team uh, for inviting uh, me uh, to come and interact with this uh, global uh, Kina family so that we can learn more and uh, uh, we can comfortably move on our journey on Kina research in Malawi. Uh, Kina research in Malawi is still in its infancy. So you can be assured I will save you some time uh, with my presentation. So I'll be talking uh, about plant growth and the yield performance of quinoa uh, varieties under irrigated and rain-fed conditions of Malawi. And the, it's barely a year since uh, we last uh, planted our first uh, quinoa trial. Uh, in Malawi. So uh, we have a long way. We have just started the journey. Um, <clears throat> I have some colleagues who assist me with the data collection and the uh, data management. So uh, I'd like to recognize them, uh, Jacinta and the Hita. And the, some of you have visited Bunda. I think you are familiar with them. Uh, I know Bob is present here with us. <clears throat> uh, so I intend uh, to show you the geographical position of Malawi. Uh, then you can relate uh, with the, uh, the Andean region where quinoa originates and the potential of uh, producing quinoa uh, in Malawi. So those who have not been to Africa, or you are not familiar with the region, uh, Malawi is here. So it's a, about 1,000, uh, 1,500 kilometers in length from that point down to that point. And the, in the way, this is about 200 kilometers. So it's fairly a small country uh, located along the, this is about 15 degrees, uh, uh, latitude just in the uh, north of the Tropic of Capricorn. And the Malawi lies along the Great Rift Valley, which runs from uh, Dead Sea down the Nile River all the way to Malawi. And the, its geographical features are characterized by mountains and valleys. So we have got a wide variation. Uh, several agroecological zones close to more than nine agroecological zones. So in our journey on quinoa research, we will have to consider all these agroecological zones uh, if we are promoted and contribute to food security in the country. Uh, a bit of uh, context about Malawi. Uh, okay. The, uh, we are, this small piece of land hosts now about 15 million people. And the, that's fairly, oh, it's uh, com comparatively on a high, high density populated area. When you compare with the, our neighboring countries, Zambia, they have about the same population and yet they cover all this piece of land. So the reason I'm talking about population density is that it has uh, given a, a very high pressure on our natural resources. And the, the land is no longer as productive as it was 40 years ago when I was a little kid. Uh, today, uh, in my time when I was a little kid, 
application of uh, inorganic fertilizers was a luxury. But today, if a farmer is to harvest something for consumption, they have to apply organic, inorganic fertilizers. But they can't afford. Um, so that's the implication of the high population density uh, we are under in. And there are many other uh, challenges. The economy, of course, is agro-based with the uh, tobacco as the main cash crop uh, for, for forex earning. And the, our major food crops uh, include maize, potatoes, rice, and cassava. Of course, we have millets, that's the sorghum and finger millet, uh, which our forefathers used to consume. But there came an era when <clears throat> maize production was overemphasized as the food. So that has impacted, I think, our food security. But we are now coming back thinking about all those millets. So you hear about neglected and the underutilized food uh, crops. Other cash crops apart from tobacco include tea and the sugar cane. So uh, we cannot do without agriculture. Um, okay, uh, this is just a world map to, sh to show you the relative position where Malawi is, uh, somewhere here. And uh, this is the, the Tropic of Capricorn, and this is the equator. So if we are here, so this is the, the Andean region. And I think quinoa will do very well there if we go by temperature. Of course, our climates are modified by the geographical features. <clears throat> okay, um, a quick look at the average temperatures and rainfall. Uh, we have a unimodal type of rainfall, which runs from November through to March and the maybe mid of April. And the uh, up a little bit ab above a thousand millimeters of annual rainfall on average. Temperatures, they are fairly uh, around 30 maximum temperatures. And the, uh, sometimes the, in, in the, our cold season, they will go down to uh, around the yeah, below 10 degrees Celsius. So in our initial thinking, we said, I think quinoa, since it's, come, it's grown under uh, high altitude areas, then maybe we can grow it during the uh, cold season or the winter season. But because it's dry, then we have to irrigate, which brings in another challenge for small scale farmers in our country. <clears throat> um, food insecurity or nutritional insecurity as well is among the major challenges that our country uh, face. And the, I've already given you a background to that. The pressure is so high on the resources and it has led to uh, this high food insecurity. So, why do we do, excuse me, okay. Uh, sometimes we can harvest enough maize. I said maize is the food for our people. It's known as the food. Uh, but even though at national level we can harvest enough, but the nutritionary, that is not translated into food security. Because you are just looking at quantities of this uh, a carbohydrate and even the distribution across the country can be a challenge. So um, we are talking of crop diversification as well as dietary diversification if we are to achieve food security um, uh, for Malawi. So it's going beyond having adequate quantities of maize. And therefore, we have to look at other crops that can. Uh, uh, improve our, the, diver, uh, di the diets of our people. 
Um, <clears throat> now, because of the food or nutrition insecurity, malnutrition and the stuntedness, which results from malnutrition, continue to affect a large section of our population. Uh, the Malawi Demographic and Health Survey conducted in 2010, which is uh, the, late, the latest, reported 47% uh, percent of our people as stunted. Uh, stunted. Stuntedness is a real problem in Malawi, and it's not unique to our country, but possibly the entire sub-Saharan region, and also, of course, maybe other developing countries in the world. So, um, and another indicator of uh, malnutrition, uh, this malnutrition I'm talking about is under, nutri uh, under nourishment, uh, resulting uh, from not taking adequate uh, nutrients in the diet. So, the report also report, uh, uh, gave about 4% of both the rural uh, population and the poor urban, 4% uh, as wasted. So that's really a serious case when you talk about wasted uh, conditions of undernourishment uh, effects. So um, <clears throat> I have a very good neighbor of mine. He's a senior lecturer in human nutrition at our university. And he's very passionate about doing everything he can to improve the nutritional status uh, or change thinking and it is contributing greatly to changing the government policy on food and nutrition. And uh, in this picture, I'm showing uh, his son. Um, so his son uh, is posing a photo with uh, his cousin and he also another cousin. So pro probably we can assume they are sharing about uh, maybe 25% of uh, their genes. And uh, uh, because uh, my neighbor, Alexander, he's so passionate about this, he took this photo deliberately uh, to spread the message that we need to feed our children uh, for the first 1,000 days they are born, uh, if we are to uh, give them a good, uh, if we are to avoid the malnutrition and the stuntedness. So at the age of 12 years, his son uh, compared it to his cousin here, who, who was at 18 years, uh, the son was much taller, as you see here. And then compared it to the boy, the other cousin, at the same age of 12 years, this is the boy, and he, he, he is um, almost twice uh, as tall as his age mate. And uh, what these pictures are demonstrating is that uh, um, under the less privileged settings, the, uh, the environmental effects, which is largely attributed to uh, diet, has got a big impact on the stature, uh, the growth of the child. And of course, the IQ, because at this stage, uh, the Matimba, this boy, was in grade 12, uh, grade 10, while the cousin there of the same age, in a less privileged setting, was in grade 5. So quite a big difference. And uh, I wouldn't expect him to be very effective in contributing to the economic growth later when he grows, if he continues to live under that. Of course, it's not all attributed to nutrition, but also the um, disease burden 
in that setup. And the, of course, that correlates to the nutrition in the final analysis because um, when you are undernourished, uh, the body is also, uh, com uh, immunity is compromised. <clears throat> so malnutrition, our undernourishment is a big issue. And the things don't have to be like this uh, to our people. So we, we need to do all we can to help them. If it means uh, introducing quinoa uh, to improve the nutrition uh, status, we have to do it. And uh, this is why when Kevin invited me that uh, we should join them on this uh, journey of quinoa research and introduce this crop to Africa, I did not hesitate because this is a big problem to our part of the world. <clears throat> now, think about uh, when this boy was 14 years old. Uh, this is his dad, my neighbor, very good neighbor. 14 years, and his dad is 41 years. What? Uh, he's already, he has already caught up with him in height and is taller. So that's the clear impact of the nutritional background. So he is like me because I grew up in a village, less privileged conditions. Uh, today, uh, these boys, these youngsters are growing under a more privileged conditions. Uh, they can express their full genetic potential. So it's a big impact when we talk of, about stuntedness due to the nutritional background, and we have to take it seriously. And so we want to take it seriously with the quinoa. <clears throat> uh, of course, these are other factors that have impacted or contributed uh, to all these status, and the, uh, we are aged to, to look for other alternatives uh, to improve the nutritional status. We are looking at, we are talking about HIV AIDS, which has also increased the statistics of orphans, making these people more vulnerable uh, to undernourishment. And then compromised immunity in children to, due to pure nutrition. And of course, we have climate change. Uh, it means uh, production of food crops is also challenged and the are challenging the food security in the country. <clears throat> now, the reason why uh, we are convinced uh, that quinoa should be introduced in Malawi to our farmers is because of its nutritional value and its potential uh, to contribute uh, to the food security. And this has been well uh, articulated here. Um, and again, another reason is it's wide ecological adaptation. And therefore, we can, we, are, we can be less assured of developing or sourcing out varieties that can uh, be grown in the, across the agroecological zones of our country and uh, contribute to the food security. But we are also looking at uh, this crop can become as an alternative source of income. Um, once it's uh, adopted and it's promoted, uh, farmers can also sell to the local market and uh, maybe to the export market. And uh, that can contribute to their welfare and the uh, uh, So we are convinced we have to get on board on quinoa. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, our goal is to make sure we, have intro we, we, we introduce this crop to the farmers so that they can grow it, and then that way promote its uh, production. And then, uh, uh, of course, of high grain yielding varieties, and then we can contribute to this uh, food security. So the objectives, uh, of the studies, the experiments we have conducted this far uh, were to evaluate plant growth and grain yield performance uh, of those 11, uh, 11 varieties that were given to us uh, under the mid altitude and the high altitude areas of the country. 
and the, then uh, evaluate these also under both irrigated as well as rain fed and see <clears throat> uh, under what conditions can we get better yields. So it's a one, uh, it's a one-year data. Once uh, we have grown two cycles under irrigation from July uh, to October, and then we had another. We had to put up uh, an undergraduate to grow it under the uh, rain-fed conditions in the work we have done uh, this far. <clears throat> uh, these are the materials that Kevin uh, sent us. Um, Adam came in person to deliver this. Uh, where is Adam? Okay. So we had a variety uh, from Colorado, uh, the Inca Red, Pasankara. I think this is uh, Frank's uh, variety. Uh, the brightest brilliant. Uh, Bio Bio is from Chile. Cherry Vanilla again from Frank. Matt Hude from British Columbia, the Redhead, again Frank, I think, uh, QQ74, Puno, Titicaca, and QQ065, and the Rosa Junine. Um, we had enough, just enough seed to plant uh, two, uh, two, in, in two sites, uh, Bunda and uh, in Bembeke, which I'm uh, going to show you soon. Uh, the last two, we didn't have enough, so the first season uh, cycle, we had to multiply the seed. And the <clears throat> we tested these in two sites. Bunda, representing the uh, mid altitude uh, areas of the country, 1,200 meters above sea level. And the uh, next, I have a map showing the annual temperatures. And the uh, Bembeke, which is at uh, 1,560 uh, meters above the sea level. And uh, it experiences prolonged con con uh, cold conditions. So our expectation was that Kinoa was going to do better here than here where it's warmer. So... <clears throat> The two sites where it's mid altitude is here, Bunda, where uh, I am based, and the, we have a mountain range across here. So Bembeke, the other site where it experiences um, prolonged uh, cool conditions is here. Um, <clears throat> so those are the two sites with the resources available that we tested. Uh, in our first uh, cycle. So these photos are just showing uh, the land preparation taking place. This is uh, Bembeke, um, uh, busy uh, watering the fields. So what we did was to prepare uh, small plots, two by two meters, because of the amount of seed we had. So. These are the plots that we had. So each plot, uh, uh, the varieties we have planted at each plot across the three uh, replicates. Uh, so we had to use irrigation because this is a dry uh, cold season. <clears throat> so uh, we have, okay, uh, I've already explained uh, this. Okay, plant spacing was done at 20 centimeters. Uh, this rows were spaced at 20 centimeters apart. And then um, after sowing and germination, uh, the plants were thinned to uh, 10 centimeters apart. Um, because we are making maize crop as a reference crop, uh, as a, um, the food crop, the staple food crop. Uh, in maize, normally uh, there's 150 kgs of nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium fertilizer in, applied. So just wanted to compare. They say if we apply the same input to quinoa, how much of quinoa can we get 
and therefore we can uh, the farmer can easily uh, decide whether it's worth it to put the equal amount of inputs into a quinoa or maintain their maize crop um, and forfeit the high nutritive values in quinoa. So we decided to use the same fertilizer rate uh, to this experiment. Okay, uh, this is a bunda site uh, soon after germination but before thinning. So the plants at the uh, bunda site, the mini altitude, they had a very good germination um, compared to the, uh, the other site where it was a bembeke. <clears throat> So the information we collected included the germination uh, percentage, plant height, and the, that, that's after uh, thinning. Uh, we observed the colors of uh, the leaves, and all morphological characteristics, uh, days to flowering, and, and the biomass was determined at the end, as well as grain yield and the, uh, the seed characteristics, uh, productivity, uh, the harvest index. <clears throat> um, the experiment was repeated uh, after harvesting the irrigated one, uh, which was planted in December uh, and then harvested in early April. So with the same uh, agronomic management. Uh, but this time we only uh, did it at uh, the midi attitude site because our resources could not allow us uh, to go to the other uh, site. So the same data and parameters were also uh, calculated. <clears throat> uh, this is just to show you the crop stand uh, at Bunda. This was after about one and a half months. Um, this is the time it started to warm, warm up. Uh, but we experienced um, delayed growth rate um, during the month of April, uh, June, July, because that's when it gets very cold uh, in Malawi. So, but when it started warming up in the middle of October, the crop started picking up and we had a beautiful uh, crop stand. Uh, this is at Bunda, particularly. <clears throat> Um, that's the crop. Uh, give me some slides up. I've jumped some, I don't know where, some slides are missing, yeah? Okay, anyway, this is just to show you how the crop uh, performed uh, in these photos. So I think it, it can't do better than this. It's promising according to the crop stand itself. Uh, here, just want you to relate. Uh, this is Chris Banco from here. Uh, he is actually the one who linked us uh, with the, uh, Kevin. And this is Dan Ter Avest. He's also doing his research uh, in, in Malawi, Bunda. And this is my head of department. So when Chris visited, uh, the crop was at this stage, so we took uh, the opportunity to show him the crop stand, and that this is the material I've shared with us. And the, they are not stunted. So you can look at the, <laughs> the plant height. So if the plant height is that high, then I think it's doing fine. <laughs> uh, okay. Okay, um, these, the, these pictures are showing you the crop stand during the rain fed uh, conditions in December. So generally when you look at the stand, it's not as vigorous as the irrigated uh, crop stand. <clears throat> so let's see what the figures are showing us. Okay, this is the harvesting. Uh, that's the whole team of uh, working on quinoa, a dedicated and the enthusiastic 
because it's a new crop. This is after threshing and winnowing. Uh, that's our quinoa. <clears throat> so we, the, the way we processed the, the grain is a thing similar to what uh, Hassan showed us. So we organized some women with the, some baskets and the bamboo baskets and then they winnow until it gets to that, uh, that green. Okay, so what are the, what did the, uh, uh, the figures saying? After looking at uh, the pictures, uh, under the irrigated uh, conditions, um, this is days to flowering. <clears throat> On average, uh, this is, okay, the yellow color bars is for the Bunda site, the mid altitude, and then uh, the brownish uh, bars are for the uh, the other side, which was uh, which is cooler. So generally, at, at the warmer side, the plants started flowering much earlier. After a month, they started flowering. While at the other side, uh, they took longer uh, over. Uh, a month. And uh, when we look at uh, uh, the time to harvesting, um, it was, I think, the opposite. We, uh, the crop at the other side, uh, Bembeke, of course, was being managed by our colleagues. Um, the crop matured early and then uh, uh, they had a harvesting relatively area, but uh, you are looking at a difference of uh, maybe 104 days uh, to 112 or 108 uh, days. Um, when you look at the, the across the varieties, we had two of the varieties that matured uh, late. That's the Ecuadorian and the Inca red but the rest there wasn't a significant uh, difference um, in the maturity uh, period. <clears throat> so the reason why there were two uh, uh, significant differences across the sites in the maturity period, uh, we are attributing it uh, to maybe the extended watering that we had at Bunda, at the mid altitude. Otherwise, we wouldn't expect the differences in the maturity period. While maybe at the other side, uh, of course we monitored their monthly, but uh, somehow maybe uh, the, the irrigation was uh, assessed uh, early. So that's why it matured early. So uh, we are yet to repeat uh, uh, the experiment at that site and uh, check uh, these results. And uh, under the rain fed, the period to maturity was a little bit earlier. Uh, you are looking at less than 100 days, where, uh, or more or less the same, uh, because, uh, when you look at uh, the Bembeke site. So uh, there wasn't a significant difference when you compare with the other sites. Uh, but still, the, now under rain, rain, rain fed season, interestingly, uh, mud hued and black seeded, they are the ones that uh, matured a bit late, above 100 days. That's really interesting, and uh, we see there maybe seasonal uh, effect on the different uh, cultivars and how it would perform. <clears throat> okay, uh, I shifted this photo to this uh, so that you can appreciate the crop stand um, at the Bembeke site and the, at Bunda. The crop stand was not that good. And the survival of the plants, we attribute it maybe to the extreme cold conditions experienced in that site. And of course, at this stage, we are not discounting maybe management uh, 
that was exerted on these plants. But these translated into uh, the yields that I'm going to show you in a moment. So the Bunda site had a very good stand, while on the other side, uh, it was a poor crop stand. Okay, so, so if you look at number of plants per hectare, you can see uh, the blue is representing the Bembeke site where we had a poor crop stand and the, the brown ones representing where we had a very good stand. So there was a big uh, difference. Uh, no wonder we are looking at uh, big uh, yield gaps between the two environments. Okay, so when we look at the plant height, how tall the plants grew, uh, the Bunda site plants performed well, they grew up to a meter high and longer, but on average, uh, you, it was about a hundred meters, a oh, hundred meter, uh, Oh, sorry, one meter uh, tall, sorry. Uh, when you compare among the varieties, uh, QQ74, uh, Biobio, uh, the brightest brilliant, cherry vanilla, as well as Ecuadorian, they, they are standing out in, in terms of plant height under these uh, conditions. And let's see if these are translating also into yield. What, uh, <clears throat> uh, pardon, are we getting? Okay, uh, if you, again you look at the rain fed, under rain fed conditions, uh, we had the brightest brilliant, cherry vanilla, multi hued, uh, as well as a black seeded this time. Rosa Junine, we now had enough seed and we included it under rain fed. Uh, it did very well. So, the very same varieties are also doing well under rain uh, fed conditions, but there is a, a large variation in their performance when you compare with the, the under uh, irrigated conditions. <clears throat> and then when we look at grain yield, brightest brilliant, multi huge, Osher vanilla, QQ74. Titkaka, uh, they did well. Uh, look at about yeah, three tons uh, of grain per hectare. And we find these as uh, doing very well uh, at Bunda site. While the, the other site where we had a poor crop stand at Bembeke, it's below half a ton or maybe half a ton or just above it, a uh, half a ton, or maybe 0.6 of a ton. Uh, that's the highest yield to get in multi yield. So the environment really affected their performance. But of course, uh, management. So these are the issues that we needed to investigate further and see if we can get uh, cultivars that can do well under those conditions. Um, <clears throat> or other ecological zones of this similar um, climatic conditions. Under rain fed, in terms of grain yield, we have black seeded doing very well, and multi hued and of course, uh, brightest brilliant. Bio Bio this time, as, uh, in terms of yield, did well under the rainy fed conditions. But take note, uh, those that did well, they are about one and a half tons uh, per hectare. Uh, of course, with the black seeded going up to two tons. So we can grow uh, the quinoa under rain fed, but we'll have an impact on, there'll be a reduction in terms of uh, grain yield <clears throat> but of course discount the cost of irrigating uh, so maybe this is still okay uh, 
harvest index, uh, looking at the productivity of these varieties, black seeded, grown at Bembeke, was very productive with a very uh, high uh, harvest index. Uh, likewise, QQ74. Um, then at Bunda site, Titikaka had a very high um, harvest index, just ab uh, above 0.5. And uh, yeah, so in terms of productivity, we would say black seeded, um, QQ74, Titikaka, and not uh, discounting the brightest brilliant. Uh, these are promising in their highly productive under these uh, conditions. <clears throat> um, under Renfed, black seeded again, uh, did very well in terms of productivity uh, with the high, um, relatively high uh, harvest index, close to 3.3, and followed by Inca red, um, brightest brilliant. Uh, I think we have to get more uh, cultivars or varieties from Frank because his varieties are doing well under uh, our conditions. Uh, of course, we need more, of course. <clears throat> um, did, did we face any challenge? Uh, on pests and diseases, we have observed white grubs, especially under rain fed conditions. Aphids. Uh, uh, were prevalent and the stink bugs, uh, they were common, but they did not affect uh, from visual, or we didn't assess the infestation, but they, they were not so heavy on the crop. Um, but we have observed these uh, in the field. <clears throat> um, that's, that's showing you the aphids that we have observed. Uh, these are the white grubs. So when they get to the root zone, then uh, they can uh, do a big damage. You just see the plants wilting. And when you check out, then you find it, uh, these culprits. <clears throat> okay, uh, from uh, the work we have just done, uh, the trials we have conducted, um, we, it's, our conviction that quinoa crop production is possible under Malay climatic conditions. And they should be able to produce enough grain from the same um, <clears throat> unit area that we can put up maize and feed the families and they contribute uh, to the food security. Now, when we look at the five uh, the, the, the varieties tested, five of these are promising. Uh, the brightest brilliant cherry vanilla, the mud hued, QQ74, and Titicaca. And I think I forgot to put the black seeded. They are promising, and I think we want to take them further. Uh, and I get it, okay. It get it cropping when we look at July to October, gave higher yields than the rain fed cropping, uh, which is running from December to March. So, if a farmer can afford to get, think the July to October period is the best for quinoa production, and the, you have less problems, uh, pests and diseases under those conditions. But we needed to uh, repeat these experiments and see if that can stand. <clears throat> um, what are the challenges that we expect in the work? Uh, in our quest to promote quinoa production in Malawi, accept, acceptability into the people's diets. I told you that in Malawi, people think maize is their food. And if they go to bed without eating a, uh, a meal or based on the maize, then they think they have not uh, taken a meal. They can take potatoes, they can take rice, uh, cassava, but there has to be a maize based meal. So uh, I think it's one of the challenges. We have to do it uh, because we have to. Uh, 
that it's one of the challenges and we need to work out ways uh, we can convince people to include quinoa in their daily diet. So next, uh, from here, uh, we think we need to get a more diverse germplasm or cultivars from our collaborators and the, uh, or the quinoa family uh, and evaluate these across seasons and sites, uh, depending on the resources we can get. And the, then we can select specific varieties for each ecological zone. We should also consider adapting or develop agronomic technologies that are appropriate to the local conditions or practices. Uh, for instance, sowing uh, in rows, uh, everything, uh, all operations under small scale farms, they are done manually. So labor intensiveness has to be considered. Should we just broadcast as they do with the millets? Or do they have to plant uh, meticulously uh, in rows? Um, should we do that? Uh, so all those we have to look into and uh, see which appropriate technologies we can adopt. Uh, <clears throat> we also need to have data on nutrient composition. So we need to do uh, nutrient analysis and uh, we should develop the locally acceptable recipes, and these can facilitate uh, adoption of quinoa into the diets. Um, we already have some work being done uh, by our sister department at the university. Uh, Agnes is working on this uh, with the support from uh, Bob. Uh, is very passionate to see quinoa being adopted. So. He, he, he said, I'm going to support the this nutrient and I saw so Agnes is uh, working on this uh, with the Bob's support. So thanks, Bob. I think we can uh, make mileage uh, from this. Uh, OK, we, we are also thinking, should we think of, you know, uh, talk to the farmers about inorganic fertilizers when they already cannot afford to buy inorganic fertilizers and apply to their maize crops. So animal manure is a possible uh, alternative. So one of the organizations where Bob uh, goes to uh, when he visits Malawi, uh, they do run orphanages. And we gave them some seed, and they, they planted uh, in a trial setup. Uh, because we told them to plant it that way so that we can take advantage and go and collect some data and see how it's performing. That's in the south, uh, south part of Malawi. So with the, uh, his own intuition, uh, the manager there decided to take one rep there and apply chicken manure. Then in the other two uh, reps, he applied uh, uh, the inorganic fertilizer, just to test that. When when he told uh, he told us about this, we said, "Okay, how have you <laughs> done it anyway?" Uh, but it's interesting. It's good he applied the entire rep, rep, replication. So when we visited, uh, we were amazed to see that the chicken manure are doing better than uh, the other two reps where the inorganic fertilizers have been applied. So. We think we need to investigate on this, and the, uh, that could be an answer for our small scale farmers who can't afford inorganic fertilizers. So we are also looking at under education, maybe use of matching. You can uh, minimize uh, moisture loss. So we need to investigate into uh, this as well. And the, we are also talking of broadcasting, or versus the uh, planting in rows, uh, which one will be better under our uh, small scale farmers? Um, at this point, I would like to thank uh, Kevin and the, his wonderful team here for supporting us uh, to get on board on this quinoa work. And the, 
we are not bugging down. We'll be with you. Please give us more material uh, so that we can uh, also start it, uh, eating quinoa in our diets, dairy diets. And I uh, would like also to acknowledge uh, the Department of Crop and Soil Sciences, Luana, because they supported the undergraduate student uh, uh, who worked on the rainy fed uh, trial. And uh, Bob, uh, for your passion to see quinoa going beyond Bunda uh, and Bembeke, please, uh, we are counting on you to, uh, to support the promotion of quinoa in Malawi as well. Uh, at this point, I think I've exhausted my time and I would like to say thank you. Thank you.